Sometimes, I have to confess, it's just the title of a story that really gets me intrigued. I think, hmm, what on earth could that all be about? Now, I also must confess that I wasn't familiar with the work of David Paulides before doing this story, but of course I had to do a little bit of research and find out who this person was and what they were all about, and I'm very glad I did. Definitely gives this story an air of uh, Twilight Zone and the X-Files to it, and all the better for it as far as I'm concerned. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to the weekend, so you know what time it is. Yes, it's time to once again sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. I remember listening to a David Paulides interview where he said he was approached by someone in law enforcement who commented on the theory of serial killers and the mysterious disappearances Paulides was tracking. He said, You know, Dave, serial killers never kill where they live. Look at your map of the US and of all the disappearances in America. There's only two places where you have no activity in rural central Nevada, and in a strip right down the central U.S., from western Oklahoma to east of Oklahoma City, northward to North Dakota. So, whatever is doing this, that's where it lives. I live in rural west Oklahoma. When I first heard this comment on serial killers on the YouTube replay at 2 a.m. one Tuesday night while finishing a paper for college, I resolved I would find out who or what was kidnapping and killing these people, because if the theory was correct, it lived around me. Now, for some of those listening, the name David Polides needs no introduction. For others unaware, however, a brief introduction is needed. For the past hundred years, at least, there have been mysterious disappearances of people across America. The disappearances all fit a similar category. People are taken inexplicably. There are zero witnesses as to what happened or where they went. Often the disappearances are in national parks or rural areas, though many urban cases have been discovered as well. For reasons unknown, berries, well, such as berry picking, and boulder fields frequently come as locations or activities of missing persons right before they disappear. The missing people typically have military or religious affiliations, and typically are either of very high intellect or people who are disabled in some capacity. If in the wilderness, in a group, it is typically the first or last person in line who disappears. If in an urban setting, typically the soon-to-be disappeared person will be in a group setting and then decide they are tired and want to go home. They leave the group scene and are never seen again. There has never been a single witness to what happens to these people. Many are never returned. Those who are returned are found without shoes on in the wilderness and placed in areas either so remote and far away from the original disappearance site as to be almost comical in the distant traverse in the short amount of time since they were disappeared or in areas already searched by rescue teams. Those returned in urban areas are often found in water weeks later. Search dogs are never able to find the person central from where they were last seen. The medical examiners typically find flies in the groin area of those in the water, which indicates that the person must have died on land and then been placed in the water. They will be shown to have been dead for only days, but will have been missing for weeks. And, more recently, several medical examiners testing the dead bodies have found traces of GHB, the date rape drug. GHB completely incapacitates your body, but you are still completely conscious and awake, but unable to move or do anything. You are completely helpless. No one has ever found evidence of who is doing this. The only thing we know is... Something terrible is happening to certain people, and we do not know what is doing it. Well, I know. It was a Friday night. 
I'm taking classes at a small state college about 30 minutes from where I live, and was driving out to an evening class I have there. My house, well, more precisely my parents' house, is on a large farm literally in the middle of nowhere. The land is flat and like a pancake with occasional undulations in the terrain. Our home is set across from a small hill overlooking our hundred or so acres of farmland. It's a lovely centennial style home with a wraparound porch. It's so much cheaper to work the farm and stay home and commute than to move into the neighboring city for school. Below us, below the hill the house is nestled against, off to the west is a pond. My mum had just taken several pot pies out of the oven, and we had all three of us eaten. My mum cooks good old country cooking. Not the healthiest, but definitely the tastiest. I downed one for dinner. Then I grabbed my backpack and laptop and a cup of coffee to go, threw it all in my truck and drove off down the dirt road. The sun was starting to set, setting off brilliant reds, oranges and yellows in the sky. I was alone in the rattling old Chevy, dust kicking up a thick plume behind me. I'd made this drive down the two-mile dirt road a thousand times. God, I always loved being alone. It was quiet. No distractions, no drama, no pain, no one to hurt you. But, well, sometimes it was depressing, but rarely, if ever, terrifying. I had my head back against the headrest. The window was down, letting in the cool and dusty autumn air. I was letting my gaze roll between the road in front of me and the side window view. As I moved my eyes back to the road, I noticed in the rear view mirror something disturbing. It was like something invisible behind me, but it had gotten dust on it so I could see the outline. It was like the dust was displaced in the air. I shook my head and pressed down on the gas, leaving the sight in the dust trail behind me. I took a long drink of coffee, then stared back into the rearview mirror once more. The truck sped off down the dusty back road, eventually hitting the paved county road that ran into the state highway running into the nearest town where the regional college was. The fiery evening sky turned darker, and darker, into a death-like shroud that enveloped the never-ending sky and white stars, like eyes watching their prey in the forest, popped out. I pulled into the parking lot outside Friedman Hall, the building that houses the computer science and math departments. I felt exposed in the parking lot, for some reason. I don't usually feel like that. It's... As if I was a gazelle walking through an open prairie where any number of deadly predators could be waiting unseen. The building is a U-shape, three-story building with a courtyard in the middle. The courtyard is typically darker at night, as the university chose not to build a lighting system in it. The easiest way to access my class is to walk through the middle courtyard and go in through a door leading to the interior main hallway. I almost froze with this thought of my usual path, given my feeling of exposure. What is it that's causing this anxiety, I wondered to myself. Regardless, I walked to the courtyard. As I stepped into the dark air in the courtyard, I found my heart speeding up, almost as if I'd just finished running a hard sprint. I picked up my pace a little. The walk was long, as the building was very deep. I started to feel a fog in my mind. The kind of fog you have when you're incurring a panic attack. I bent all of my will now, just reaching the door and getting inside. I had been keeping my peripheral vision well covered up until that point, but now all I was seeing was the door. I still don't know what it was that triggered me, but I started running. I was now about a hundred feet away, and then... It happened. I snagged my foot on a crack in the walkway. I went flying and smashed into the ground. I'd somehow braced my chest initially with my hands, but the wind still got knocked out of me. I looked up, my eyes almost level with the ground. 
and I saw it. Its feet were an abyss, black pools on the ground. My vision blurred, and I opened my eyes really wide, realizing some blood had leaked into them from a gash in my forehead. I then looked, and the shoes were familiar now. I heard a voice. John, are you okay? It was my friend and classmate Brent. I started to get up as my friend helped me to stand, his face filled with concern. I then started to piece together what had happened. I must have freaked myself out, probably because I'd been listening to the David Polites interview, and it was on my mind, and then that thing in the rear view mirror. And then I tripped and fell, and, well, the blood in my eyes must have made me see incorrectly Brent's shoes. It made sense. Brett walked me to the bathroom. I cleaned up my face and arms, which were scraped and bloodied. And then we walked the stairs up to the second floor and found a couple of seats in the back of the class. Much to my surprise, class had already started. I was expecting to be ten minutes early, arriving about 6.50, but our professor has a very regular, repeatable format of schedule for presenting. It was obvious he was about 15 minutes in. My phone confirmed this. 7.17, it read. Ooh, must have hit my head harder than I thought, I surmised. Oh, class was dry tonight. We were working on Lagrange multipliers and basically working through homework exercises that I'd already finished and which weren't due until Monday. It was a two-hour class. About an hour in, I started feeling really sick. My body felt exhausted and achy, and I could barely focus. It was so extreme, I started feeling a sense of panic, like I needed to get out of there and go to my bed. I nudged Brent. Hey man, I whispered. I'm going to cut out early, not feeling so good. He nodded, and I got up to leave. I stepped out into the hall. Most of the lights were off, save a few lights near the stairwell. My exhaustion kept me from walking straight, and I tripped, hitting the ground with a thud. Well, it's really not my night. Hey man, you okay? It was Brent. He helped me up. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Let me drive you home. You're not looking good. I nodded. Sounds good. Brent walked down the stairs with me and helped me across the courtyard. I hopped up into his truck and we drove out of town and back onto the familiar state highway. Brent lived about ten minutes away from my family's farm. Our families have known each other, well, for decades. We've never been super close friends, but have gotten closer the past year since we take several of the same classes and partner on group homework assignments. Our mums had been very close friends throughout church for, well, for most of their lives, and that relationship anchored much of the historical relationship our family had with Brent's. It was dark outside. Very dark. We talked a little about life and caught up some. As we pulled up to the house, Brent snapped his finger in remembrance. Hey, do you have a copy of the code we're working on for our Java 2 class? Yeah. It's on my laptop. If you want, you can come in and I can walk you through it. Perfect. I wanted to add in my part this weekend, so we're good to go to submit by Tuesday. We got out of the truck and went inside. Brent plopped down on the couch as I put the laptop facing toward me, but perpendicular to him on the love seat next to the couch. My browser had already been opened when I flipped my laptop open, and it automatically refreshed. I quickly scanned my email while Brent was engrossed in his phone. The first couple of emails were not interesting, but the third one was. It was from Brent, from an hour ago. It read, Hey man, sorry I won't be able to make class tonight. My mom had to drive into Oklahoma City for the weekend to meet up with my grandma for her unexpected surgery that she has to have. She should be fine, but they need to get it done. I'll be in Oklahoma City until Sunday night. Hey, can you please send me the notes from tonight? Also, email me the project for our Java class. I'll add in my code over the weekend. Thanks, 
Brent. I froze. My heart started racing. What? I thought. Is this a joke? But something deep down told me Brent's email was right. There was one way to confirm. My mom. She would know. She knows everything going on at their house. Hey, uh, give me one sec, man. Need to hit the bathroom, I said to Brent. He nodded without looking up from his phone. I shut the laptop and walked up the stairs. I found my mum lying in bed reading a book. Dad was out of town at a men's conference with the church for the night. Hey, what's up? She asked as I poked my head in. Hey, is Brent's family out of town? Oh, yes, his grandma's having surgery. He took his mom, and they're all staying in Oklahoma City for the weekend. I talked with Jamie about an hour ago or so, and she said Brent was driving down there. Who was downstairs then, in my house? I asked myself, my pulse racing. I was frozen, a deep feeling of dread running through my body. Someone's in the house, Mom. Get in the closet and shut the door. Get the gun, she said, as her eyes got wide and she jumped up and ran to the closet. Oh, God, send your angels, she prayed under her breath. I reached into the gun closet on the bedroom wall, grabbed my AR, a couple of magazines, loaded it and nestled the weapon up against my shoulder as I stared through the scope. I flipped on the laser light and started walking. The upstairs hallway was bare with all the lights on, just as I'd left it. I started walking down the steps of the stairs. I peeked over the railing, down into the living room. Brent, or whatever it was, was not there. I decided it best to go room by room. I cleared out the two other bedrooms and hall bath, while keeping my eyes glued to the stairwell in case it came up. The upstairs was clear. I then walked back to the top of the staircase and descended, one step after another. The creaking of the boards under my boots betrayed my location, so much so that I decided to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. Whatever you are, Come out now, I screamed. I have an AR-15, locked and loaded, and I'm ready to kill. Silence. I walked down to the bottom floor and moved through the living room. Nothing. I walked toward the kitchen. The lights were out in there. And there he stood. You want to know who I am? He said. His eyes locked onto mine. He started walking toward me with a harsh intent. I pulled the trigger and let round after round go. The bullets bounced off of his chest and fell to the floor with a ring. He grabbed my shirt and smashed the gun to the side with his other arm. He lifted me up into the air. The house went utterly silent, and outside the windows, bright white lights could be seen. Like... Headlights of cars, but not cars. These were coming from the sky. His eyes had turned completely black. I am your enemy, he hissed like a snake. His tongue looked almost reptile-like. I was shaking and yet frozen, unable to move. His hands felt like burning iron, searing my skin. I screamed in pain. Do you know who we are? He lifted me higher. God, his strength was incredible. He lifted me up so that my back was pushing against the ceiling. I was completely disoriented, but realized that he was levitating through the air. And not just us, but random kitchen objects were levitating and rising in the air too. Pieces of silverware, the blender, a colander. We live here. And you are our enemy, he hissed again. Remember, 
killers never strike close to home. Maybe then you'd find out who we are. Now, take off your shoes. You are on holy ground, you human worm. His face was like an abyss and snake-like, his eyes like a void. I felt my shoelaces being undone and my shoes coming off my feet. I looked up and a bright white light shone all around us. The ceiling was gone. We were no longer in the house. We were on the hill next to our house and above me was the source of light. It was a flying saucer. A dread I had never felt before was in the air. Time was suspended. I looked around me and standing on the hill were others. Other people, but no, not people. They were evil things, like voids standing. My eyes couldn't process what they were. Their eyes were black. Hate spewing toward me. Why me? I asked. Because I broke the one rule we had of secrecy. Because I detest you so deeply. Oh, I've watched you your entire life. I couldn't control my hate of you. He then put his searing hands on my neck. You will worship me before this night is over. He hissed and started to pull me upward toward the craft. My vision turned blood red and I started to pass out. I was suffocating but still alive. And then... In the last moment, I saw it. A tiny white light, like a star. The demon didn't see it until it was too late. But it flew up, straight toward us and straight into the demon's face. The last thing I remember was a scream of horror coming from the demon and then the little light flying into my pocket. And then, all black. Nothing. I woke in my bed. It was morning. Lovely sunlight streamed in through the curtains. I stretched, feeling as refreshed as you could possibly be. I sat up and suddenly remembered everything. I jumped up. <sighs> Mom! I ran out my bedroom door and down the steps. The smell of pancakes, bacon and coffee fluttered into my nose and I walked ever more slowly down the stairs. I could hear my mum in the kitchen. Morning, she called as she was getting a plate ready. She had no idea. I walked up to the table. <laughs> Maybe it was all just a dream. Did you go hunting last night, or were you just cleaning your gun? She asked. What? No, I replied, taking a cup of coffee. Hmm, weird. I found your gun down here on the kitchen counter. She went back to the stove to flip the pancakes. Then I remembered the last thing I saw from last night. I reached into my pocket and found a small piece of folded paper. I took it out and opened it up. Inside a small note was written. I'll never leave you. I will always protect you. What on earth did you think of that one? Crazy, crazy story. Yes, well, I thought that was pretty good. I really enjoyed reading that one. A lot of fun, but a little bit weird and wonderful at the same time. Well, this one's dedicated to all those long-distance drivers out there. You know who I'm talking about. I know a lot of you on the road for hours on end like to listen to these stories, and I truly appreciate the fact that you spend the time listening to me. So, have a good one, and drive safe, okay? Well, I'll be back again on Monday with another story for you. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?